it's five now. We just thought we'd hold it for a little bit. Let more people come in. It's raining. No. Are we good to go? We are live. Okay. We're just going to wait a few minutes. No, don't start it. Oh, it did. Okay. Can we pause? No. No. <laughs> okay, so we'll just, um, just for all of you who are watching, we're just going to sit here for a few minutes. Uh, we're just going to pause for maybe about five minutes before we truly start. Uh, just so some people come in because it's raining here in New York City. Is it not loud enough? Not loud enough. We need to speak up still. Okay. Thank you. Well, while we wait, how many people here by a show of hands are blockchain converts? Yay. And blockchain skeptics? We'll try to convince you today. Yes, we'll, yeah, we'll stand please. up. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. We're just pausing here until for just a few minutes. Is this live streamed? On Facebook and YouTube. I went to um, a conference a couple of days ago, and there was a quote there that stuck with me in Ethereum con uh, conference where someone from Ethereum said that blockchain is either the biggest scam or the most undervalued asset in history. So these kind of talks can help you decide which side of the fence you think it's on. We'll introduce ourselves uh, properly in just a few minutes, but my name is Maria Kessler, and this is Alexia Bidet. Um, I know that the program actually said that Ed Claris would be here, but unfortunately he had um, to be, he was called out of town for a client business. But we have Alexia here to sub in, and she's an associate of Ed's, and um, has a great background in media law as well. So she's going to do a fine job for us. Thanks. A few more minutes. Sure. Yeah. Has anyone in the audience been to some of the other events during the week, blockchain events during the week? Yes. Did you enjoy it? Good. It's when you go to those events that you really see, like, wow, this is, well, happening. Right. Whether it's happening tangibly and it's, like, actually happening is a question, but there are a lot of people who are there, and it's, like, it's really a, a community. I was really surprised when I saw how many people were at this event last week, and, like, this is the livelihood and world of a lot of people now. It's really quite cool. Absolutely. Um, how do we find the live stream? Is it uh, searchable under this name or youtube.com slash Adorama TV or Facebook.com slash Adorama? So uh, if, you, if you're trying to find the live stream, it's youtube.com Adorama slash Adorama. Adorama TV, and it's facebook.com slash Adorama. Okay. Okay, then we'll go ahead and start. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, my name is Maria Kessler, and I'm here with Alexia Bidet. Um, we'll go ahead. I'll start the introduction of blockchain, and then Alexia is going to talk about smart contracts I'll introduce Alexia 
after we finished with just the blockchain portion of it. Um, let me start by introducing myself and why we're here. Um, I'm a veteran of the stock photography business. I started my career in stock photography at FPG International, if anybody remembers what that was. Um, I then worked at Dynamic Graphics. Dynamic Graphics was purchased by Jupiter Images. Jupiter Images was then purchased by Getty Images, as has almost every other stock house. Um, during my days in stock, I managed key photographer relationships. I oversaw global production shoots, collection acquisitions, distribution uh, partnerships with other, added, with other um, stock agencies, strategic sales agreements, and various rights issues, including model releases, sensitive subject releases, privacy issues, and trademark and other copyright issues. While in the stock photo industry, I was also part of the trade association that's known as Picture Archive Council of America, or it's now known as Digital Media Licensing Association, DMLA. As part of this trade association, we were involved as, an, as a trade association to combat different issues that were facing the photography industry. At the time, one of our biggest threats was the unauthorized copying of textbooks by Google. It later became what's known as the Google Book Settlement. We also worked with a lot of the other photographer associations to combat common copyright, trademark, privacy issues of the day. Um, after Jupiter Images was acquired by Getty, I thought my career in photography was over. Little did I know, about six, nine months later, I would be working with a company, started to launch this company called Image Rights International. Image Rights International is an image recognition software company that finds unauthorized images and secures retroactive licenses, something that's known as post-licensing uh, today. From there, for the past several years, I have truly tried to stay out of photography by syndicating articles um, as well as video to and for other major media organizations. I've been extremely interested in new technologies and startup businesses. So about 15 months ago, when I heard there was this meetup and the topic was smart contracts, I was really intrigued. And I sat there and I learned about blockchain technology and smart contracts and all of these little light bulbs were going off because it was the perfect technology to solve the problems that I had run into when I was in the photography business. It was the solution to all the problems that crossed my desk regarding some of the rights issues I would encounter, including orphan works and um, piracy, et cetera. So here I am again in the photography business. I've been doggedly pursuing blockchain since then, and I'm here to share blockchain with you because I've seen technology get ahead of photographers, and it hasn't been pretty. But I truly believe that this technology, blockchain, can allow photographers to really reclaim control over their own images and hopefully provide enrichment to them, both in revenue and additional revenue streams. So let me go ahead and start. Um, the name of the program is Blockchain and Photography, Blockchain and Smart co Contracts in Photography. I'm going to handle the blockchain portion, and Alexia is going to handle the smart contracts portion. First, I'm going to step back. There's this wonderful TV ad that is running um, by IBM, and this is really how the blockchain and smart contracts was first described to me because IBM has been working with um, shipper Maersk for over two years in blockchain. So we'll, we'll take a look at the ad. is a tomato you can track from farm to pot, to jar, to table. And 
and serve with confidence that it's safe. This is a diamond you can follow from line to finger. And trust it never fell into the wrong hands. This is a shipment transferred 200 times, transparently tracked from port to port. This is the IBM blockchain, built for smarter business, built to run on the IBM cloud. Now, I'm not plugging IBM. I'm just plugging the fact that this was an absolute fantastic description of the whole supply chain, going from supplier, manufacturer, all the way to the end user. And that's exactly what the story of blockchain is all about. It's that secure transfer that holds by every step of the process from the manufacturer all the way to the end user and then we can apply that same thing to digital rights. OK, so what is blockchain? I have to say, and I want to say, almost every presenter I have heard has said the same thing. It is not Bitcoin, absolutely not Bitcoin. Blockchain is the technology that enables Bitcoin and the products and services that exist. So blockchain. Um, is blockchain can apply to over about 30 different industries. It will be relevant in personal identification, real estate, tracking titles, leases, liens. It's also going to be relevant in healthcare. It can prevent counterfeit pharmaceuticals. It can um, securely transfer your personal medical information, etc. The three things that really identify blockchain and some of its attributes are its decentralized or distributed network system, its open ledger system, which is its recording ability, and the fact that the records are immutable. As, as a funny uh, anecdote, at this uh, blockchain conference last week, someone asked Joe Lubin, the founder of a uh, Ethereum to explain blockchain with words that weren't invented in the past two years, um, which is not an easy thing to do. So that was pretty funny. So I just wanted to stress, I've, I've put up a word cloud here. And there are plenty of words that are not a part of this word cloud. I could have put in oracles, miners, proof of work, proof of concept. You don't need to know how the blockchain works. I have a little example a little bit later. I can show you a little bit. We don't need to know, you know that it's another protocol, et cetera. All you need to know is the solutions that it's going to provide. The same way, we don't really need to know how a hydraulic engine works, but we do need to know that it's going to power something and that it provides power for something. So we don't need to get caught up in how it works. Think of this technology in the same way that the internet got started. You don't need to code HTTP. You don't need to learn Python to see websites. But you do get the benefits of it from using the websites and sharing the data on a global scale. There are five things I want you to remember from this talk. I want you to remember that the blockchain will give you 100% control. What you do with that control is another question, but it will give you 100% control. Blockchain is profound because it will provide an audit trail for every aspect of your workflow through to the license. Blockchain's immutable, and that will breed trust. Transactions and payments can be immediate. And to harness this technology, and this is an important part, we need the clients the clients purchasing and using the images to understand the added value that will be derived from your work. So there was um, an article that I was reading uh, on a website, and one technology was so, one technology company was so amazed with everything that was going on, and this is what they had on their site. They had the tech, um, they posted on the site the technologies we collectively refer to as crypto are the biggest thing to happen in the history of mankind and will result in the largest accumulation and redistribution of wealth 
the world has ever seen. So there are a lot of people out there that are very bully on crypto and what blockchain has to offer. OK, let's go over what these attributes actually are. What makes blockchain so attractive to people in finance and securities is its resilience to hacking. Let's think of this centralized picture, the one on the right, as the vault of, well, let's, let's use a fun example, the Bellagio from Ocean's Eleven. George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon are over there scheming, you know, and they're, they have a wonderful cast of characters, and they're going to plot how to get into that vault and the centralized unit. And you know what? They actually do, despite all the security and all the guards. Now, let's look at the decentralized blockchain on the left. And you notice there are lots of different systems, and each system or each node is got the little person by it. If one node on the decentralized system is attacked, it can go down. But the data and electronic money is safe as is recorded on every other node. You would have to attack all the nodes at exactly the same time to succeed. With the nodes distributed all around the world and each having its own system as, a, as security, the distributed centralized, decentralized system is irrefutably the safest way to store assets. One of the things that a, a real life example is when we had 9-11 here in New York, um, I was working at the time for American Express. American Express had all of their offices down at the World Trade Center. They, the very next day, they had running in ads for the following week that your information is safe because they were co-located. They had all of their information co-located in Phoenix, Arizona. So when the New York office went down, Arizona was up and running, and all of your data, your transactions, your credit was safe. With the decentralized system, you think about all those other nodes running all over the world, it's immensely safer. So that's decentralization. Now let's go to Open Ledger and the immutable record. The information that's stored on each node in the decentralized system is merely a database. You can think of it like a, an accounting ledger book. You can keep track of transactions, events, balances, loans, liens, and yes, licenses, royalty splits, and license details. What you need to keep in mind is that anything written to this ledger is always there. Uh, it's always immutable. It cannot be changed. So if you make an unfortunate transaction, you can correct it by doing a, another amendment to that transaction. But the first transaction will always be there for everyone to see. So I have a little example here. So we start out with a rights managed license for a book, circulation 100,000 in North America only. We're like, okay, that's great, that's recorded. Then we go to a rights managed ad, same image. It's for five years in print in the UK. Great, that doesn't conflict. Then you, you license the same image, rights managed image, for another book, 500,000 circulation in Russia. Great. But with smart contracts, and we'll get to smart contracts in a few minutes, the blockchain supports them, and they're just a set of self-executing -ex data code. If the incoming data agrees with the defined parameters in the smart contract, the contract will execute. And everything, will say, and everything will say, OK, let's accept that. But if there's no agreement, like here we have the royalty-free image trying to be licensed for publishing, and we have three separate conflicts, the license is going to be rejected. So with smart contracts as part of the blockchain, the data, if there are any data conflict, conflicts, they're automatically resolved. So which would you trust? The centralized system that has one area that keeps all the records, or the decentralized system where all the records are replicated 
and every single node. That's the power of blockchain. Also, just, just as, a side, as an aside, adding to the blockchain makes it actually stronger. To add any node to the, new, to the network, the newcomer must get permission. The permission com can come in a number of forms. It, it can be something like someone to serve a resource-intensive problem using processing and computer power or offering a proof of concept. The community grants approval to this new node. And finally, once the new node joins, the new node needs to replicate all existing information in the ledger as well as the business rules. So once that's done, the node operates within the network and adds an additional layer of security. Okay, now let's apply this to photography. What does that all mean? Let me get back to the concept of control. When I first saw on, on, the, on the left, uh, we have theft, and on the right, we have unauthorized modification. And I purposely used um, the images of Emma Gonzalez and David Hogue because they've been in the news recently. And these were two perfect examples where I thought, oh my god, blockchain would solve this. When I first saw this article, and the article is, the photographer's photos become icons of the never again movement, and no one knows who she is. Actually, the name's cut off, but that's uh, Emily McGovern's uh, portraits of Emma Gonzalez and David Hogue on the left. And she wrote in this article, we'd all like to believe we don't need recognition. We can do our jobs and humbly continue on. But when your entire future depends on whether or not you've been published and where, it can be less of a courtesy and more of a necessity. So when your images start popping up everywhere without any proof that they belong to you, it can be scary because you can't control it. And you, can def and you definitely can't predict an outcome. Emily McGovern has been tracking down the various uses. These were images that she took, I want to say it was within two days, three days of the mass shooting, one of the very first rallies and she went up to Emma Gonzalez and David Hogue and asked to take their picture. She got them, she got their permission, and then these were posted and then they were taken. So she is pursuing, uh, pursuing her rights there, but um, she was really scared by all of this and really, you know, it was a, it was a moment for her. Um, so in the same way, that can be said of the unauthorized modification of the Emma Gonzalez picture on the right. Uh, with blockchain, you can, un you can actually, with the, its DNA, you can actually understand when there's been a modification. I mean, this was all over the news as well. Um, Emma Gonzalez was uh, photographed for Teen Vogue, and in fact, um, a, an anti-gun rights uh, website actually put put her tearing out the Constitution was which was completely false so with blockchain as the solution you can prevent this from happening or you would know who made the modification this is a little bit of a big uh, slide and I try to go through this carefully this is the audit trail this is why blockchain in photography is so important. Each one of these stars, there are five stars here, represents a point in the workflow process where an image can be tracked. Each star is an, an, is an event that should represent new information that's recorded as part of the image record on the blockchain network. Star one, this is the point as close to capture as possible. While it would be ideal to have this come out of the camera, similar to geolocation and time stamping, the processing power that it would take at the moment is, very, is too difficult. So we'll take the next best thing and look for that signature as soon as you've prepped the images. When you've retouched them, assigned model releases, this is when you should have that first star. I, sh I should tell you the software doesn't exist yet. 
but it will. The first star is your signature. This is like your image DNA. Because it can't change, and it can always be traceable back to you. When you hear people talk about blockchain, they talk about this concept of provenance. And this is what they're talking about. It's you are the source, and it can always be traced back to you. Stars two and three here um, is where you choose to promote your images and distribute them. Most likely, if you're not self-promoting your images, um, you have some sort of an agreement in place with an agency, a rep, or a marketplace. The nature of that relationship, your royalties, and any restrictions that you choose to put on your images should be recorded at the upload event on that new platform. Maybe you have just a star two event. Maybe you have stars two and three um, during the event. Who knows? Star four is the license with the licensee, the end user. The actual information involved in the license is what is recorded at this event, who the licensee is, the license details, and of course, the price. Star five would be any additional extensions or amendments to that license information. Of course, you could have multiple licenses, so long as they do not conflict. And also, note the turquoise clouds. I have payments and statements, license monitoring, and market information. Each of these clouds represents more information and additional events that are possible in the blockchain audit trail. You can easily market, monitor your images. If you know where all of your images are and all of the licenses, when a monitoring system comes back with five new sites, well, they're unauthorized. Payments using cryptocurrencies, tokens, or wallets can also have funds cleared in near real time. If anybody's been in ph the photography business, it takes three, six, nine months to reconcile and clear these payments. So that would be a huge improvement. Accounting and statements are also available. And again, the market information. All data can be tracked. Aggregating all of your image data, all of its uses, is truly powerful to your own marketing systems or in aggregate with the other information that an agency or a rep can provide. So I, I brought my blocks here. And it's a little bit like the DNA. It's all these steps. So we have the image DNA when you start. And then you upload it to a platform, maybe one platform or maybe two. And then you license it. And then you make an amendment. It's all there. They're all chained together. And they are put on the node with the other information in the ledger. That's what the blockchain is all about. OK, control and audit trail breeds trust. The information that's stored on each node in the decentralized system is merely a database. You can think of it like accounting. You can track the transactions, everything. All the metadata is present. All the release information is present. The records, records are updated on every single node every time there is a change. The network is reliable. The critical thing here is that the licensee, your end user, is getting a guaranteed image free from defect. No conflicts and that going forward as well. That's critical. It breeds trust and it's added value to the licensee. So where are we? This is a slide from one of my favorite information sources. If you guys don't read Fred Wilson from avc.com, he's just tremendous, and I highly recommend that you read him. So in addition to Fred Wilson being ahead of the curve in nearly all new businesses in tech, he often has great advice. And this is one of the guest slides that he posted this past week. This is a slide from a token summit a few weeks ago while the presentation was mostly about financial businesses, this to me was a great slide on the evolution of blockchain. It's just about right for where we are in photography. I would say that maybe 
finances are just a hair uh, ahead of us. So where it says installation 2016, 2018, we're probably installation early 2018, 2019. And I'll show you why in a second. There we go. We got a lot happening in the photography field with blockchain at the moment. So who's doing what? What do we need to watch out for? And by the way, this does not include everyone. This is a busy slide. A number of these players have a common foundation. So let me talk about the ICO players. Let me talk about WeMark, ImageProtect, CopyTrack, Kodak One, and Baidu's Totem. So the, what's common in a, in a number of these, ImageProtect, CopyTrack, Kodak One, and for the information available also for Baidu, they're all starting with the foundation of image monitoring and post licensing. So they either have a business that is existing or they've been in that business and that's the foundation of where they're starting from. WeMark is the one that's a little bit different. They're starting out as a marketplace, but I'm sure that they will include image monitoring at some point. Um, they're all trying to cut out some of the middlemen. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, there are other uh, players in the field you should be watching as well. Um, I would say Image Rights International, the company I used to work for, they have blockchain records recording at the moment. Not sure what they're planning, but they're probably a good one to watch because they have a similar background as the other uh, players that are doing ICOs at the moment. And then there's a new entrant in the market, uh, Permission Machine. It's a, a company from Belgium. Um, and I know they're also doing image monitoring as well. The creator players, creators players um, on the right hand are very interesting companies worth watching. They're not in the photography field, but they're important because they're in music or digital rights. So um, for me, Jack, and dot blockchain media are fascinating because they are starting with the actual file format and putting all the blockchain image, uh, sorry, all the blockchain information in the file format. And it's interoperable and it can work with across an entire industry. Uh, so they're very much worth watching. Mecenas is an art auction house. And then Verisart and Ascribe also uh, live in the art field. And they um, attribute authenticity or the owner source um, in them. And I say to watch out for these because it, we're talking all digital rights here. It's similar to what we're doing in photography. It's, it's different, but it could probably be used to enhance the photography business. So. This is our industry today. It's mainly centralized around broker gatekeepers, big agencies or representatives, and they own most of the clients. Uh, the world going forward, some people would like to get rid of those middlemen. I don't think that's necessarily gonna happen, I think, those middlemen actually offer some real value, uh, something called search, something called customers. They have all the customers at the moment, so it's really important to watch what's going on here. Um, maybe they can enhance their own businesses and provide better information or maybe more transparency, but there's a real value that they're offering that has not been solved in some of these startup companies, or at least it's not it's not um, being articulated yet. OK. Blockchain technology, it solves many persistent problems. It solves the issue of control. Again, what you do with that, how you decide to give away your control or keep your control is what this is all about. But you have control. You have a complete audit trail. And importantly here, Again, I'm going to say it five times, trust. The end user, the licensee, has a guaranteed product. For the first time ever, 
they can be assured that they're not going to be brought to court. How many times have we heard of these? There's a model release issue, there's a branding issue, someone had a, an image of a piece of artwork in the background and now, you know, this big company is being dragged into court or made to settle to get rid of this issue. Payments and royalties are potentially paid out faster. Resources for image theft, the monitoring services are readily accessible. And this thing called orphan works that I used to hear about all the time goes away forever. The issues that still need resolution, the complete transaction. We are at the beginning. There is no network built yet. It's still a concept. Record keepers, registries <clears throat> are going to need to talk to each other. So all those players that I was talking about, Totem, By, uh, Baidu's Totem, CopyTrack, Kodak One, et cetera, they need to talk to each other in order for this to really, really work. Basic service, services such as search, promotion, <laughs> access to customers is still going to be needed. If they're truly reinventing the agencies that exist today, they have a lot of work to do. Unauthorized uses probably will still exist, and they still must be found. And there's this little thing called US law. Copyright for adjudication is still required, at least for now. So. That concludes my portion of the blockchain session. Thank you. If, if you don't mind, we'll hold some questions to the end. I do want to go ahead and introduce Alexia Bedet from Claris IP. She's focused most of her practice on content review, media law, privacy, intellectual property, fair use, virtual and augmented reality technologies. Prior to joining Claris Law, she worked as a law clerk for BuzzFeed, where she supported the news team. She's also worked with law firms specializing in media law in both London and Paris. She's from Switzerland. She trained as a lawyer in the UK and moved to New York to pursue her passion for media law in the US. Uh, she's also completed her LLM at Columbia University School of Law. Alexia is an AR and VR enthusiast and frequently addresses legal challenges in that area. Uh, most recently, she was at South by South, Southwest um, this past, what, a month ago, two months yeah, ago? Yeah, in March. Yeah, and she'll be at the upcoming AWE conference in Santa Clara. What's AWE stand for? Augmented World Expo or exhibition. Okay, One of the two. sounds good. She'll be at that, that conference in Santa Clara, California. And this is an important thing. She's also co-authored a chapter on data collection practices for VR and AR companies in Siegel on entertainment law. And that's a big deal in the law field. So congratulations. Thanks, Maria. So here's Alexia. OK, so I'm going to talk about smart contracts. But first, while everything that Maria just said is fresh in your minds, there's a couple of little legal nuances that I thought would be interesting to add on. Um, so first, who here are photographers and take pictures? OK, so when you want to protect your picture, what would be the first thing you do? Watermark. Sorry? Watermark. Right. Register for copy. So and watermark, register. And who do you register it with? USCO. The USC, right, so the US Copyright Office. And that can take time. It costs money. Two days. Oh, it is? Yeah. Wow, OK, that's quick. Before you get an answer as well? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Wow, OK, been lucky. Um, so that's one of the benefits, really, with blockchain would be this question of registration. But before completely buying into this idea that, oh, we can register pictures on the blockchain, it's interesting, if you're reading about this, you're probably seeing differences between proof of existence and proof of possession, right? When you register with the US Copyright Office, a benefit you get is that that's a presumption that you're the owner of the copyright asset, right? And whereas if you register something on the blockchain, because we have the US, we have copyright law, which says that basically registration with the Copyright Office, that's the authoritative voice in the United States 
that you are the owner. If you register something on the blockchain, that's proof of existence, right? That's proof uh, that at the point that I registered something on the blockchain, that I held it, right? That I had it. Because what happens when you register something on the blockchain, and I'm not going to get technical here because I can't, because I don't understand it, but with my limited understanding of it is this. Let's say this is a photograph, right? What happens is when this, the photograph itself, the file, doesn't get stored on the blockchain. You have a hash, right? So the, the digital, this photograph has a bunch of digital numbers that say that it's a digital asset. And then what happens is those digital numbers get crumbled into something, and that's called that basically you hash it. And that result, that output of a string of data, is what gets registered and sent basically to the blockchain. So that's proof that you had it, right? Because in order to get the number that comes out as a hash, you have to have the picture. It's impossible to get a hash, the output that comes out of the hash, without an input. So it proves that you held it, but it doesn't necessarily prove that you owned it. And that's going to be a really interesting thing, is how, going forward, can you use blockchain to prove not only that you had it, but that you owned it. Because right now, the law only recognizes the registration of the copyright office as proof that you have it. So it's this interesting tension between blockchain on the one hand, it's this decentralized platform, and you don't want it to be held in the hands of one person, like the copyright office, but at the same time, the current laws we have only recognize registration with that one person, that one body, as real proof of ownership. So I'd say it's really interesting to learn about all these different registrations. But when you see these systems that are offering you registration of your copyright, it's important to think it through. And what does that really mean? Like When push comes to shove and I have to prove that I was the owner, is this going to be enough? And right now, until the law is changed, and I'm not saying they won't. And we've got, I saw, I've heard people running for Congress that are super excited about blockchain. So the laws can change, but just right now, it's important to remember that you have to see these two things in parallel. So that was one thing to add on. I hate being the lawyers that are the doomsayers, but I think it's important to just keep that in mind. Um, and another really interesting thing is, like Maria was saying, um, there's a lot of trust. And you can trace, you know, it's an audit trail and who's doing what with your photographs. And one really interesting capability of blockchain and, and hashing is to be able to prove when someone's actually infringed your copyright and used your image, right? Because now, let's say Maria takes a photograph and I use it and I edit it and I tweak it and I put it up. How does Maria prove that I used her photograph? You compare it, you say, well, my photograph's been up and available, chances are she's seen it. Um, you know, you have to show and make a case that I've used it. You have to prove that. And then once you've proved that I had access, which usually is not too hard to prove, you have to prove that it's substantially similar, that they're the same. So proving copyright infringement can really not be easy because you don't have an easy way to know for sure that I used Maria's photograph. Now what's really cool and it's actually understanding a little bit the technicalities of blockchain that have made me more excited about it. So I'll try and make this super simple, because that's what I get about it. When I take this picture, right, it produces a hash. This picture is only ever going to produce one hash. Let's say Maria's picture is going to produce hers. So I started with her taking it, so we'll go that way. Maria takes a picture and hashes it. She now has that hash. That hash can only come from her photograph. I lift her picture off her website, I edit it, I try and edit it and be smart enough that it doesn't, it's not you know, a slam dunk that I used hers, and I put it up on my picture. How can hashing help prove electronically that I actually must have used her picture? Now, her hash, if she hashes her photograph and I hash mine, they're gonna be totally different hashes, right? Because photograph A will only ever give one hash, photograph B, will only ever give another hash. So that doesn't help. But every photograph is made up of tiny little bits, right? And if you hash to that level of granularity, right, if you hash the 4,000 bits in that picture, and you hash the 4,000 bits in this picture, and then you match the hashes, if there's enough of a degree of similarity between them, then you know for sure 
that I have taken hers because the only way that this photograph will give the individual bits of hashes like Maria's is if I used hers. So right? um, Alexia, that's why I like to t refer to it as the image DNA. Right. Because you can't change DNA. And that DNA is present. If anybody's heard of CryptoKitties, that's uh, one of the examples of blockchain collectibles that's out there in the market. And you can breed additional crypto kitties, but the DNA exists, and you have a genetic tree of that crypto kitty. So it's very sim similar. The image will exist because even if she tried to mish them together, the DNA from my image still exists in hers. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Um, oh, I was going to ask you, is that, would, do you think the courts would accept that as evidence? So that's a really um, good question. Digital evidence in courts, it has to come, there's a lot of rules, it has to come from a machine that's, um, I don't remember exactly the words, but that's uh, in good order, from data that's proper, that is not uh, corrupt in any way. So whether blockchain and hashing will be considered good enough digital evidence is one thing, and also, if the data coming into digital evidence is corrupt in any way or isn't good, then the, out, the digital evidence doesn't stand up in court. So if you're using images that aren't yours or that are corrupt in any way, question whether it'll work. But possibly, I mean, it's a lot more convincing if you can prove 90% match if the little individual hashes. I mean, that should be pretty convincing. It depends what kind of judges you'll be in front of, if it's you know a savvy with it, tech-friendly judge or not, so, you know, remains, we'll see. We'll see. We have, someone else can be the guinea pig, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was basically it, just building on uh, what was said, and now we can get to smart contracts. So what is a smart contract? A smart contract is basically, and these are the big buzzwords we're hearing everywhere, self-executing and self-enforcing. And let's unpack those and what they mean. But just, so smart contracts are digital contracts. Let's start with that. And there's nothing new with digital contracts, right? Think about it. Every time you go on a website, you accept the terms of use by clicking and staying on that website. That's a form of digital contract. The difference is if you breach it in any way, you're going to need a human, lawyers, courts to enforce it. So the big benefit that blockchain adds to smart digital contracts is the self-enforcing, and self-executing abilities. So unpacking those, self-executing. What that means is that basically you don't need human input once the smart contract is entered as a transaction on the blockchain. So what happens? We decide to enter into, uh, Maria's going to license her images to me for my website for X amount of dollars. So just as we would with a normal contract, we decide those terms together, talking about it. Then those would be reduced to code. God forbid, not by us. Um, there are a lot of companies out there now that are um, building you know, software to build smart contracts. There's Open Law is an interesting one um, that's built on top of Ethereum. So then it's reduced. So we agree to the terms. It's reduced to code. And then that those we both would digitally sign, right? Because on the blockchain, we have digital signatures. You have a public key, which is what everybody sees. And you have a private key, which is kind of like your password. So we both digitally sign this contract, and it gets sent as a transaction to the blockchain. Because the contract itself, you don't have files on the blockchain right now. You have just records of transactions, right? So that contract would be like a record of it is sent that, that, that we've made this agreement together. And then what happens is, right, so my agreement was your license, Marie is licensing her photograph to me for, I don't know, let's say $100. What happens is the second that from my wallet, $100 or the equivalent in cryptocurrency goes to Maria, automatically I get that file. There's no processing. She doesn't have to rely on someone else. She doesn't get to choose. If she's changed her mind by then, tough luck. But at the same time, if I don't pay her, right, she doesn't send it to me and I haven't paid her and then she's chasing me for payment, like none of that happens. It self-executes. What the blockchain does is it monitors and you, you code the contract so that the blockchain knows and the, when certain uh, conditions have happened, that it triggers something to happen in the contract. Um, so there was a fun uh, an example. For example, I read um, a farmer who's getting insurance, 
and the farmer says, I pay the insurance $100 every month, but if in a month, for five, there's an average of five days where the temperature was above 85, right, which means that I couldn't do my crops properly or my crops died, I get, I don't know, $1,000. And what would happen is you would code the contract so that the contract knows, okay, we're using AccuWeather to decide what the temperatures are. Those things would all be coded in the contract. And all by itself, at the end of a month where there's been five days that were above the temperature that you put it's coded into the contract, you would get that money back. And no one, I don't, the farmer doesn't have to call the insurance company. There's no, it just happens on its own. Which leads to this question of self-enforcing. What's in great about um, smart contracts is you're not relying on a third party. So like Maria's examples with the banks for money, here for contracts, you're not relying on lawyers and you're not relying on courts. That's a super simplistic view. I would not want you to walk away with this thinking that, oh, smart contracts gets rid of the law. I don't think it does, and most people who have been writing about smoke smart contracts right now don't think it does either. There's gonna be a way that they live together. Um, but there's no question of whether you've breached something or not, right? There's no question of, have you used these pictures without paying me? That's not possible, because if you haven't paid me, you don't get the pictures. There's no question of, oh, but the temperature was over this for five days, you didn't give me the money. It doesn't happen, because if the temperature hits that, you get the money. So this question of self-enforcing is exactly because of that. There's no manual input, which is necessary. And it's also irrevoc irrevocable, right? Once it happens and the money's been paid, there's no going back. Um, which poses, causes problems, right? Because what do you do if there's been a, you know, there's, you can contracts, you can make a contract and it turns out that we agreed to something different and even though we reduced it to code, we were confused, I didn't mean the same thing, right? That happens sometimes. There's no way to go back on that. So what I think will be interesting is with smart contracts going forward, it won't be so much anymore about whether you've breached the contract, it'll be about restitution going backwards, right? You're gonna see people going to courts and not say, hey, Alexia breached the contract. It'll be, Alexia got this money and she shouldn't have and now she has to get it, you know, I need to get it back. Um, so it'll change if they do start to get used frequently. I think it'll really change the nature of the claims that, we're, that we see more often in courts. Um, and you can always amend a contract. So that would be a second right. transaction. Exactly. Um, so like for a photography example of a smart contract, you often hear, oh, it's really cool with blockchain. You could get paid per click instead of like a flat fee, right? You could license an image to a website and every time that someone opens that page or sees it, that's when you get paid. But how does that happen? And this is actually pretty cool. So like Maria was saying, a lot of this is not set yet, right? A lot of this uh, technology is not you know, rolling smoothly and there's not a bunch of people that are getting paid per click. But it's interesting to see how it would work. So let's say you have a smart contract which says, okay, I'm licensing this image to you for your website and instead of getting paid a lump sum at the beginning, you're going to get paid every time somebody opens this. How does that happen? So. You have this smart contract that's living on the blockchain that has these terms in it. The photo itself, though, isn't living on that chain, right? The transaction, the record of that contract is. So how does it work? Like, how does the blockchain know? How does, how does the smart contract know when something's being clicked on? So what you have right now is what you, the way that when people have explained this to me have said that it would work is that you have you have to think of it as layers. So you have the blockchain, which is one layer, and then you'd have protocols on it that can actually host the file. So like IPFS, right? It's kind of like BitTorrent. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer network where you would have that picture, not just the, ha you would have the hash that's linked to the file. So the file itself, like the, the, the JPEG of your picture, would live on that hash in IPFS. And think about it like embedding. Imagine that every time the website shows the picture, it's related to that. It's kind of like when you embed a picture from Instagram, think of it like embedding a picture from IPFS. Like if there are people who are tech savvy who are watching this, they're gonna be like, oh my God, that's not how it works. But it's <laughs> the simplest way of thinking about it. Think about embedding to IPFS. So what does that mean? 
because you have that hash on IPFS, which is linked to a file, and that hash of IPFS is coded into your contract, every time someone embeds to IPFS on the website, it kind of sends a message to the contract, right? Saying, oh, there's been a click dollar. Every time there's been a click dollar. So think that's the kind of way that, that's how you reconcile storage of facility and the actual file with the smart contract on the blockchain, which is really cool because it's all a chain which just doesn't break and you can't break because there's really clear instructions. Um, so that I think is a neat example of how blockchain could be used for um, displaying photographies and for licensing models that maybe make more sense today, right? And maybe you want to maybe be paid for every click. I can only imagine it would. Um, so, she, so she asked if it would work for video as well. Yes, it, it should. So I was just going to add in there, it would be great if you were actually paid a dollar per click in advertising. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then the other issue that they need to clean up in the advertising is the bots. You know, was it a real impression or was it right. a bot? So there's a lot of things that have to work into this, but that's absolutely a fantastic use case that people are looking at absolutely yeah um, and then like the viability of like what are the obstacles that smart contracts are going to meet lawyers are getting a kick out of writing long law review articles about whether a smart contract is a contract because what's a contract it's a promise between two individuals but a smart contract is really you're taking the people out of the equation at that point you've got really two private keys that are in contract, essentially. So is it a contract between two people? Is it a contract? Has there really been a promise? Um, so to what extent are smart contracts contracts at all? I think they are. And I think they will have to continue to live with contract law. You have people who are saying, now that you have smart contracts, contracts law disappear, lawyers disappear, judges disappear. Um, that would be interesting. I'd find another job. But I think to some extent, they're going to continue to coexist, at least for a while, right? Um, so that are some of the, the challenges, really, is how are smart contracts going to be interpreted and accepted, um, enforced, the fact that you can't go back. But it's a, it's a really exciting field. I think it's got a lot of promise in it. I think it's great, like the fact that on a rainy, Wednesday afternoon, you've chosen to be here and listen to it. I think that's awesome, right? Because I think blockchain, smart contracts, all these you know exciting buzzwords, it's great and educate yourself about them. And at the same time, I think don't be too quick to drink all the Kool-Aid depending on who's pouring it, right? Because there's a lot of hype out there right now. Um, but I think this is awesome. And I hope that that sheds a little bit of light on smart contracts and copyright and blockchain and I guess we can go to questions. Yes, we can we can go to questions now if you have some. Go ahead. Um, are you aware of any smart contract being challenged in court in the US or today? Not that I know of, right? I don't know to, I mean and smart contracts that live on the blockchain no because that hasn't, you know, that doesn't even exist. I mean it Where will you challenge it? Right? Where sorry? And that's also a really good question. Well, you could code what the jurisdiction, was that the question? You could code in the contract, just like you have in a normal one, right? Like, the, this contract is subject to New York law, and then that would be it. So, and that's another good point, actually. Smart contracts are good for some things, right? Like a license, but you, won't, you can't code everything, right? Even computers have their limits. I mean, depending on who you speak to in blockchain, they'll say blockchain can solve for anything and a million other things. But there are limits, right? There are only certain things you can code. So, you know, has someone used good faith efforts to do something, reasonableness, all those buzzwords that are in contracts, I don't really know how you teach a blockchain whether that's happened or not. So it'll depend. There will be parts, and you might have hybrids. You might have parts of a contract that are smart and parts that aren't. Um, so it depends which part of it would be coded. Right. You had a question, sir. Yeah, um, in terms of security, I understand the nodes and everything like that, but the extent 
that you want this contract to be secret. So just having all these nodes will provide more opportunities and locations to go in and grab that secret information as opposed to just that one spot. So this is a question about security and and on the decentralized network, you know, maybe you have a contract that you don't want everybody to know about. Um, we did gloss over the blockchain networks that are out there. There are public networks and there are private networks. And then there are uh, private keys and public keys. And quite honestly, there's plenty of ways to keep it very secretive or or to have something uh, that doesn't, you know, that isn't open to the public. You can have private networks as well. I just didn't want to go into too complicated of a definition. Even for the licensing of a program, it's impossible to keep. You license it for different purposes, but it's impossible to just keep other parties for other licenses so you know about. Yes, it, yes. It, technically, it's possible to keep the parties, other parties, unaware of the license that you've transacted. I mean, I would say in the white papers that exist at the moment, like I said earlier, um, the ICOs that are going on now and the white papers that exist, they're all private networks at the moment. They're all offering their own coin. That means you can only spend them in their own network at the moment. So that's all going to be private. And it can be maintained and controlled. Which one of these ICOs is best funded right now? Because, uh, <laughs> I'm asking that question because there's a number of different coins that I think are a problem. Uh, sure. So, right. Let me let me go back to what just for people who are not on the streaming, um, so that they can't hear the, what the question is. You basically asked of these players that are doing ICOs, which one is best funded? Because you had gone on to say you're well aware that the information that exists on a photograph is more than 4,000 bits of information. There's much more involved in video. There's metadata information as well which one will survive when we know that pirates are usually the frontiers people, you know, breaking through and then they become creators. So I would say they're, all of the companies that are doing ICOs at the moment are raising various funds. And some of them are doing it in stages. Um, so. I don't know that anyone is fully funded at the moment. So I know that CopyTrack did their ICO at the end of 2017. They're probably still in some stage of it. Um, Image Protect is currently in an ICO. Kodak One is in an ICO. I think they actually open it up on May 21st, which is Monday, Monday or Tuesday. Um, and the other, we mark, I believe is now open, but they're more of a marketplace, not, not just a monitoring service. Um, they're all raising quite a bit of funds. Uh, there's you know, five, six, seven entrants in this field. Will they get the funding? They, what is abundantly clear is that this is absolutely, everyone's recognized, and this is the wonderful thing, everyone's recognized all the little lights that were going off in my head in the smart contracts meetup, that this is a solution for the photographic world. It's, it's when will we get there? And when will we be funded enough? Or, or will 
Well, all five or six or seven of these companies have funding to you know, lay out their vision. Not one of these companies has a working solution. They have great white papers. You should read them. They're all available. <laughs> They're all available. That's part of what has to happen. But um, it, it's a real challenge at the moment. And that's why I'm, I'm also saying look to other industries because there have been minds working on this solution for five years already. I mean, you know, blockchain was a result of a white paper for Bitcoin in 20, 2009, in 2009. But it existed as a concept even prior to that. It just took off with the advent of Bitcoin in 2009 because it was, it was actually used and it worked. So I, that was not a good answer, but <laughs> hopefully it enlightened you a little bit. Right. Uh, so the question was, do, are the ICOs charging a fee? They're raising funds. They're, some of them are offering tokens. Um, there are business models, and some of them are clearer than others. Their business models are to charge different fees at different events or transactions. Um, again, I, I, I'm not going to go through all the details. I would strongly urge you to go look at their white papers. Because they do outline it, as I said, some are better than others. So through, I'm not sure. So the question was, um, the question came in that, you know, are there, so. so existing cases of people raising funds to okay. blockchain Are there existing cases where people have raised existing funds mm -hmm. for, to in be. Other words, I, I don't. I don't know. You have you have platforms like uh, Dada. I don't know if any of you are familiar. It's a fantastic platform where you can go and draw, and it's really great. You start a drawing, and you can build on each other's drawings. And there's really amazing art that's been done there. And they have started. You can sell. There are artists on Dada who can go and sell their work directly on blockchain with cryptocurrency. Um, and different, uh, you, you've had sales where different people have bought an image and share it together, so no one actually holds it, but they've all shared the rights to it. Um, it's happened in music. There was a, Ujo is an interesting right. company Ujo. to look at. So what Ujo, um, um, basically a band, right, or you create music and you go and you build on each other's songs and then different people of the community can listen to your song and you have micro tipping it's you know all voluntary you can either you make it voluntary right it's micro tipping you say i give you you know this amount or there's a fee so there's definitely been direct artist to consumer artist to artist platform so those are some interesting ones to look at ujo for music dada dada -D -A, uh, which is based in new york uh, for um, digital drawings um, so those are nice. So one of the examples that I also put up in creators that are also players was Mosenis, and that's an art auction house where you can actually own a portion of a piece of art. And they're trying to democratize 
the art world by putting all the art sales in the public domain so that you know how much a piece of art has sold for. And then also the, the problem that they do have with art is that when usually the artist doesn't get to reap the benefits of their, val of their value because everything you know, goes up in value once they die. But um, this would also, and, and then the original owner doesn't get to share in the portion, in the portion that um, has increased in value. And so you can actually now, through these auction sites, as it's sold again and resold um, again and again, you actually get a portion of that additional sale. Um, it's interesting concepts out there. That's why I'm saying it's a good idea to look at what's happening going around. I don't know how, I, don't think, I think that's a different concept than photography. But if it sparks an idea and you can add on to what's going on in photography, that's why we're here. Certainly, we've had issues. Orphan Works was a major issue. Um, and that's really right click, put it on your desktop, and all the metadata is gone. It's been orphaned. So, and that's been an issue forever. I can't tell you how many times we had search databases where we were trying to identify who the owner was or which agency represented that image. It was, it was, it's a terrible problem. It happens today. That goes away. Go ahead. I think I heard some comparisons to VR, AR, uh, MR. And there's AR evangelists. Um, there's blockchain there's a lot of doubt also. Um, there's a lot of skepticism. Do you see for some sort of event, some sort of technical happening, um, a tipping point moving this forward, similar to AR, VR, that world? So that's a great question. The question was, there's a lot of skepticism with these technologies, whether it's AR, augmented reality, VR, virtual reality, MR, mixed reality, blockchain, and do we see a tipping point or a certain event that'll happen which will make the skeptics into believers um, and that will really change the, the public reception to these technologies? So I, I do, and it's processing power. And we're in the age of acceleration, and it's going to happen. It already, it already has. Yes, yes. Abso it, it is absolutely going to happen. And I will say, I've seen examples. The dot blockchain media has an example. I've downloaded a song. I've used uh, my phone to just look at the image on Spotify, and I see all the information. I'm, I'm seeing it. And we're a part of it right now. The fact that we're talking about it, we're moving it forward. And I can guarantee you in all of these ICOs, they're going to have customers. Because why wouldn't you? As a photographer, why wouldn't you experiment? Five images, 10 images, 100 images, why not? See what happens. Is there, you know, are you parking them somewhere and getting passive licensing and you know revenues? Why not test? And and that's, I mean, the whole impetus of having this discussion is so that you're part of the solution. Again, I started out by saying I have seen technology go wrong for photographers. Let's get it right. Switzerland. <laughs> the question was, is there a country that's more advanced than the US? Um, Hungary. No, I'm biased. I'm Hungary. Swiss. Um, well, um, Myanmar. Hungary. Myanmar. There's a. Yeah, there's several. There's a. In, yeah. China. Look, China, Baidu totem. Baidu is, the, is Google in China. And they've got the largest Chinese visual group, visual VCG. VCG. Visual China Group, the, one of the largest stock collections there is, Baidu. 
watch them. Yeah, I can see this being used prospectively, but what is the possibility of going retroactively? You say images that were taken on film years ago or prints or something. For example, like an Adam, for example, like an Ansel Adams collection. Yeah. Could that be validated that way? It can be validated, but you're going to have to go through all the digital processes that you would just to get it online. I mean, you would have to put the DNA, you'd have to get it hashed, you'd have to make a digital copy of it. But again, in the art world, what they are doing is they have methods to actually, down to a fiber, authenticate um, a physical uh, piece of art, and then to transport it and authenticate it on the other side, you know, halfway around the world. To, to a reliable, irrefutable degree. It, the technology exists today. You just have to go through the process of doing it. Are we hopeful? I so if you I, I was supposed to say, again, the, the critical thing is the customers are getting more. Shouldn't they pay a little bit more? I, I don't know. Can we access the slides? Can I make them public somewhere? I, mean, I could put it on SlideShare. on Facebook and YouTube recorded now. Yeah. So you can go back to this. You can take pictures. Slide. I can send them. If, if, look, that's my email. That's also my LinkedIn. Send me a request. I'll be happy to share. Happy to share. So thank you very much. Thank you. Rainy day. Thank you. <laughs>